Hey, what's up, man? Hey, Chase. What's going on? Not much. I have a quick question for you. Sure. All right. How much sugar do I consume regularly? Ooh, regularly. Like, lowest end of the spectrum possible. Uh, regularly? Not... I'd say you are probably on the bottom side of the average. Uh, I don't think you do a whole lot. I think you're pretty healthy. Way less than I do. You don't eat it too much at all, do you? No. The only thing I have sugar in the zucchini bread. I know, and I love your zucchini bread. Yeah, I know, but it's not that much in there. But to me, he probably eats two teaspoons a month. You don't even miss no sugar for a month. That's my opinion. Put it that way. About once a week, I have to make my homemade butter. That's right. I'm quitting sweets for 30 days, but I already don't eat many sweets. And why does my family think I'm some sort of sugar-fearing lunatic? Well, for about a decade of my life, I was in a camp that we'll call documentarian. This is a style of eating in which you consume the foods recommended in the most recent documentary you've seen. Whether that means plants, meats, fats, or like our ancestors, or like somebody with no teeth, or even like Arnold. Over time, I learned how to turn off the documentaries and stop identifying with the camps and labels. Thank God. I now follow my own loose eating guidelines that help me maintain a healthy weight, but more importantly, a healthy relationship with food and with people. But if anything stuck from my documentarian dieting days, it's this. Minimizing my intake of processed foods makes it way easier for me to stay healthy. So I already don't consume too many sweets, but I do on occasion let in the quote-unquote healthier sweets. Meaning honey, stevia, monk fruit, xylitol, and even the sweeter GMO fruits like grapes and bananas. Oh, and ice cream. This is healthy, right? So for reasons explained in another video, I wanted to see what would happen if I took it to the extreme and avoided the sensation of sweetness at all costs. So basically that meant zero added sugar, zero artificial sweeteners, and limited naturally occurring sugars. Roughly about a serving of fruit per day. <sighs> Ice cream is a fruit, right? And I did it. And so did some of my patrons. And to be completely honest, I didn't film much of it. I didn't track much of it. If you can't tell from the introductory phone calls, I already didn't eat that many sweets. This 30-day experience wasn't too profound for me simply because I've been on the path for so long. I don't want to suggest that it's a cakewalk to quit sugar. It's hard. Food addiction is very real and very gripping, but it's tricky and gray because food is a legal and very necessary substance. It's like you can go to the movie theater and see everybody crushing popcorn and candy, but it wouldn't be quite the same if everybody was crushing cocaine at the premiere of the recent Star Wars film. Cutting down on sugar could be one of the hardest things that you ever do, but I've already been in the ring with sugar for years, so this kind of felt like running a marathon after doing all the proper training for years. This felt like taking a test that I knew I was overly prepared for. I didn't go through a crazy withdrawal, and I didn't experience an epic body transformation. But I still wanted to construct something helpful from the experience, so I took some notes along the way, and here are my top five takeaways. Takeaway one. This was super annoying. Trying to avoid sweets in the modern world is like trying to go out in the rain and not get wet. You have to be very prepared. This means doing your research, planning ahead, and practicing the art of saying no. So I was gonna get pretty sick. No bun, no ketchup, and no mayo. No dressing, please. No sauce and no buns. No dressing, please. This challenge was incredibly inconvenient and annoying to me, but more importantly, to everybody around me. I mean, good luck trying to find a snack on the go with your friends. Good luck with date night. Good luck at your family member's potluck birthday party when everybody's got their eyes on you as you load your plate up with chicken breasts and green beans because you're on an overly restrictive crash diet. This restrictive challenge really made me consider the role that food plays in my relationships. You know, the sharing of food, the indulgence of food, the tradition of food, the culture of food. No, you really hardly ever eat, only at a family function. If we have some someone's birthday or like Easter or something, you have one push, that's not very much. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't had scones and donuts for months. <laughs> oh man, that's, I remember growing up on that. Food plays a huge role in our relationships. I mean, we are who we hang out with, but we also are what we eat. So, following that logic. 
But seriously, our relationships are a huge part of the total health equation. I mean, if you quit sugar but lost all of your friends along the way, what good is that? There's no one left to see your sick bod, man. So above all else, this challenge taught me how to say no respectfully. How to turn down the cake without turning off your comrades. Like, it's okay to prioritize your health without proselytizing the people around you. Respect others, and others will respect you. If you truly want to inspire health in others, lead through example, not judgment. Takeaway two, sweetness is sneaky. I learned that sugar hides under a ton of misleading monikers. You might be able to spot 10 different sources of sweetness in an innocent looking can of soup. I learned that most sweetness comes from corn because unlike sugar, corn is considered an essential crop in the USA and is therefore subsidized by the government with our tax dollars. That's why high fructose corn syrup is so prevalent in the supermarket these days. We are literally paying into our own addiction. I learned that nearly everything on the inner aisles of the grocery store contains sugar and artificial sweeteners. Not surprisingly, this is also where most of the processed foods live because, well, an easy way to make anything taste better is to simply add sugar. Before you eat something sweet, you should ask yourself this question. Is sugar complementing the food or is sugar making the food? If a food would taste horrible without sugar, then it's probably processed garbage anyway. Here's a thought experiment for you. What would Coke taste like without the sweetness? Cutting sugar out of your diet is a really easy way to cut out the vast majority of processed foods, which, as I said earlier, is a really easy way to stay healthy. It's tricky. It's the first time I've ever read labels as much as like that. I mean, I really was reading labels, so. That's crazy. It was kind of fun. It was kind of fun, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're good. You're good, too. You don't have a sweet tooth. So. Yeah, I don't have, I don't have that, but but I do have a salt tooth. I want anything <laughs> salty. And while we're here, I'll admit that I tried this challenge once before, but failed miserably because I didn't take into account the fact that the sugar-free gum I'd been chewing every day after my coffee was actually artificially sweetened. So this time I even cut out the gum. Because I'm about to go 30 days with no sugar, no sweeteners, nothing sweet. Starting now, let's see what happens. Takeaway three. It's hard to overeat without the sweet. Scientists have described the five basic tastes as bitter, salty, sweet, sour, and savory. Spiciness is associated with a different nerve reaction, and we'll talk spicy later. I don't often crave bitter or sour foods, so when I cut out the sweets, I found myself eating a plethora of salty and savory meals, which were both delicious and nutritious, but also made me fuller faster. This is called palate fatigue, or taste bud exhaustion. Basically, we eat too much of a certain taste and our bodies stop craving more of it. We are biologically hardwired to consume a diversity of nutrients, not just more and more of the same nutrient. This is why Man vs. Food's Adam Richman had to order french fries to help him finish an ice cream eating challenge. He overdid it on the sweetness of the ice cream, but due to the contrasting flavor from the salty fries, he was able to eat more sweets. Eating more literally increased his appetite. The same thing happened to me, but in reverse. I was eating nothing but savory and salty food, and with no sweetness there to combat the flavor profile, I found myself getting full a little faster. I ate a little less. And between you and me, after the burpee challenge, I've been on a bit of a mission to gain some weight. Bulking up, baby. But this no sugar challenge made it a little more difficult to eat in a notable surplus. But I did track my weight every day, and I'm still seeing a gradual incline on the average, so... Progress. Takeaway four. And then the cravings kicked in. So I did say that I didn't experience crazy withdrawal symptoms, and although that is true, we humans always crave what we can't have. We're like toddlers that were just left out too long. We still love to break the rules. Halfway through this challenge, something started happening on my news feeds. After spending several videos badmouthing the marketing of deceptively unhealthy breakfast cereals, something hits the market. Magic Spoon Cereal. This stuff looked so delicious. It has great macronutrients, honest ingredients, and a sincere mission. Everything I love. So there I was, halfway through the no sweets challenge, confronted with a deep temptation. This paradigm shifting cereal blew my expectations out of the almond milk. Until one night, I found myself up late after a long day of work, just scrolling through pictures of cereal on the internet, drooling from the mouth like some kind of sick freak. And after the month was over,
So yeah, I celebrated by eating way too much Magic Spoon cereal. I mean, sure, it's a great option, but you can certainly have too much of a good thing. But here's the takeaway. That epic week-long cereal binge that I encountered probably wouldn't have happened had I not been so severely restrictive with my diet in the preceding 30 days. Like, I don't know if I've ever had food cravings like this before. For a second, I thought I might be pregnant. Perhaps we only truly understand temptation when we go out of our way to avoid something. You find out the strength of the wind by trying to walk against it. In this quote, C.S. Lewis is talking about the morales of Christianity, not the morales of a cinnamon surprise. But the metaphor still rings true. I mean, the challenge after the challenge is the real challenge. If you're going to impose any severe restrictions on your diet, first ask these questions. One, is this restriction sustainable? And two, if not, how will I handle the reintroduction of what I had once restricted? I see this happen all the time with people that go keto. I mean, keto works until they quit, and then carbs, 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 carbs. Nothing against keto specifically. I mean, I go into ketosis quite often, but I'm not keto. In fact, this month was like a surprise keto month because of the way I ate on it. But eating protocols like this, I just consider them like tools in the tool belt. Ideally, I'm trying to be able to utilize a plethora of metabolic tools. You know, I don't want to just be the hammer guy. Stop! Hammer time! Moving forward, I don't plan to overly restrict or demonize sugar. I'll just kind of treat it like alcohol. You know, I'll have a beer at a birthday party or I'll have a glass of wine when me and my girlfriend are off work, but you're not gonna find me drinking every day or with every meal. The same is true with sugar. Takeaway five, the relative flavor surprise. So I was having about a serving of fruit per day as my only source of perceived sweetness, and as time went on, that fruit just kept tasting sweeter and sweeter. I think that the lack of sugar and artificial sweeteners in my diet lowered my baseline for the sweetness sensation. Hell, I even traded in my dark chocolate for 100% cacao, and I really enjoyed it. It became like a like a fine wine or a cheese. I was like a sommelier of the savory. And to my surprise, even my grandpa is cutting down on sugar, and he's experiencing the same thing. I've been cutting down. I don't drink pop anymore, and I very seldom eat sweets. And after a while, you actually don't miss them. I started to drink a, a Coke the other day, and it just didn't taste good. I threw half of it away. That's great. Been, so you do get used to not having them. So a quick side note while we're talking flavor, um, for some reason during the no sugar month while I didn't have any access to sweetness, I just wanted to burn my goddamn face off every day and I totally did. Today I'm gonna push the limits. We got the hottest wings from Wings Over in Pittsburgh in the south side. Just to make them a little hotter, I got this package, Hot Ones, the last dab. There you go, you got it. Alright, yeah, that's definitely a dab. Do you feel like that's adequate? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright, that's that's a dab. That's a dab. There we go. Cheers. I might try to bomb. Oh. Maybe I'll do a little bit of each. No. Just to make it special. So you might be thinking, should I quit sugar? Here's my response. There are two types of people. Okay, I know that there are actually infinite types of people, but for the sake of this argument, we're gonna cut them into just two groups. In group A, we have the people who are already obsessed with fitness and nutrition, and who often push themselves to extreme limits just to see what happens, for better or worse. In group B are those who look at the people in group A, scratch their heads, have a slice of pie, and live happily ever after. I've been talking to a lot of people from both groups online and in person, and here's what I think. As for the more normal folks in group B, spending just one month moderating or limiting your sugar intake is a really valuable experience. You'll learn a lot about what's in your food. Also, a lot of folks primarily have learned to run on sugar, you know, they use sugar for energy. So just challenging that metabolic process for a little while is a worthwhile experiment. On the other hand, for the lunatics like me that are going to push it to the extreme, this might not be a good move. 
Personally, I do better with moderation than restriction because I have a pretty bad habit of going all in. And some people may do better with a complete restriction scenario, and that's fine too. There's no one size fits all in this total health equation. Everybody is unique, and every body is unique. And nothing that you see in a YouTube video or read in a book is going to instantly change your life and fix your relationship with sugar forever. I can't tell you how much sugar to consume moving forward, and I can't even tell you how much sugar I'm going to be consuming moving forward. But what I can tell you is that the true results come from the experience, from the internal struggle, from the journey. Guys, it's the climb. Hey, can you hear me? You had a pretty profound experience cutting out sugar. I didn't perceive to have an issue with sugar. Really what the challenge did for February was to kind of pull back a layer and kind of reveal the truth behind everything that I was eating. I mean, if we want to talk about like the first four days of coming off of the sugar, and I was a wreck. I had to go into meetings at work and just tell people, say, look, I'm not eating sugar anymore. I don't know what's going to happen here, but you know, just know that that like I am really grouchy. I you know there's something not right here. I know that I'll get over it eventually, but like they and they say the first 72 hours is the hardest, but it is really rough. The comparison that people make between sugar and like hard drugs is a little extreme. But if sugar was made illegal tomorrow and there were people on the black market swinging Nature Valley coconut butter biscuits. Like, you'd be meeting some people in some alleys. I mean, if we look at the amount of, you know, unhealthy paths that people go down that want to change, but can't, begs the conclusion that this is a pretty addictive substance. You might not lose your job, you, your marriage might not fall apart. It just is a longer term uh, monkey that sits on your back for decades. If you can just get that sugar monkey off your shoulder, this is going to be a hell of a lot easier.